So points and then lines and then planes and then triangles. And once we prove that triangles are congruent, we could find interesting information about quadrilaterals. We could say what's true in any parallelogram. And by proving the two halves of the parallelogram are congruent, we could demonstrate that through CP, CTC, opposite sides are congruent. And diagonals are perpendicular, or diagonals bisect each other and things like that. So then we said, but do triangles have to be congruent to be meaningful? Well, no, they can be the same shape, but a different size, similar. And that's where we just completed. And now we're moving into the next stage, which is, so what? Why is it important to have two triangles that are the same shape, but different sizes? Well, what that speaks to is the relationship between angles and sides. If I have a 30 degree angle at a triangle, it's got a side opposite it and whatever length it is. If I double that side to 60 degrees, does the side opposite double? It doesn't. There's not a linear relationship between angles and sides. So there's a whole field of mathematics called trigonometry, which is what deals with the relationship between angles and sides. And that's where we're going next. And the reason it needs similar triangles is because if you have a right triangle and a bigger right triangle, the angles don't change, but the sides do, but the proportionality of them don't change. So that's where we're going. In order to do that work on right triangles, we're gonna to have to understand more about the Pythagorean theorem. So we'll finally get into the Pythagorean theorem. I know you've been hearing about it and we've even been using it a little bit prematurely, but we will prove the Pythagorean theorem. And because of that, we'll also need to work with radicals. And that's where we're going today is we're gonna do a review on how we simplify and work with radicals because that's gonna come up a lot with Pythagorean theorem. So hopefully you've got the notes. <clears throat> they begin with this boxed, extremely dense summary of what it means to simplify radicals. I mean, the, the foundation is what we want is this number and this number to be distinguishable. If I'm comparing those two numbers, I want to be able to tell at a glance whether they're the same value or not. And as you can see right now, they don't look like the same, but one of the rules in simplifying radicals is there should be no perfect square other than one left as a factor underneath the radical sign. And when I take 12, I can factor that into four times three, which means there's a perfect square as a factor under here. So I can separate the square root of four and three to the square root of four and the square root of three. And the square root of four, because it's a perfect square, is just a regular two. That lets us pull that information out. So instead of three root four root three, it's three times two root three or six root three. These two numbers are value-wise the same. Numerically, they are equivalent, but they don't look the same. So we want to have a set of rules that allow us to simplify so that we can easily compare numbers. A second rule about these is that no radical sign is left in the denominator of a fraction. And that comes from the idea that a fraction means you're taking a number and dividing it into a certain number of parts. Well, root two is an irrational number. There's no, you couldn't write it as a ratio. You can't figure out exactly how many parts that is. So we don't leave a radical in the denominator. The way we get rid of that is we use what we used to call a giant one, right? We take this value of root two over root two and we multiply it. Why did we choose root two? Because that will simplify this radical. Root two times root two will give me root four. That's now a perfect square, which can turn into a regular two. I've cleaned up getting no radicals in the denominator. In order to make this work mathematically, we have to multiply the top and the bottom by the same amount to retain the value of the fraction. So when I multiply 18 times root two, I get 18 root two. And now I've got 18 root two over 10. Those are both even numbers, so I can simplify it further. I can change 18 into two times nine, 10 is two times five, the twos cancel. And this is the simplified version of this one. And very similarly, if I have a square root of a fraction, I can treat it as a fraction of the square roots. And again, I'd wanna make sure there's no radical in the denominator, so I multiply by root five over root five. 
These two multiply together on the inside to make 15. These two multiply on the inside to make 25. There's our perfect square again. When it's a perfect square, I can call it a regular five. Please note that the five in this radical does not simplify with the, fat, the five down here that's outside of the radical. They're different numerical expressions. You cannot interchange them and cancel them. So that's the finalized form. Here's two other ways that we can work with radicals and the importance of simplification. I can take some radicals and I can say, are these summable, right? Can I take these two terms and add them together? And the answer is sort of. I can add them together, but they're not going to combine and look more simple. Just like if I say, an, you know, pineapple and a coconut. I can hold them next to each other. I can even blend them up into a lovely smoothie, but I can't call them two of any one thing. They're just not the same thing. Or I can't say like X plus Y equals something other than X plus Y. So then we have to ask ourselves, what about this root 48? Does that combine with either of those? Well, at first glimpse, you'd say no, because these all look like, you know, pineapple, coconut, banana, even better smoothie. But you can't do anything about simplifying it unless square root of 48 has inside of it a perfect square as a factor. So we take this square root of 48 and we factor the 48 down into 4 times 4 times 3. And when I do that, I see that there actually is a 4 times 4, which is 16. That's a perfect square. So I can pull that out as a 4. And now you'll notice that I've got three roots of three plus another four roots of three, which means I've got three plus four roots of three or seven roots of three. By knowing how to simplify these radicals, we can take complex expressions and pull the corresponding parts together. The other thing we do with them often is we multiply radicals, radical expressions. And when we do that, the numbers on the outside, like the seven and the five, get to multiply together. And the numbers on the inside, like the 3 and the 6, also get to multiply together. However, when I get this 3 times 6, instead of multiplying it up to 18, only to then factor it down to see how it simplifies, I just leave it at this level. I change the 6 into 3 and 2, and then simplify. Now, I have a slightly unprofessional and probably inappropriate discussion about how we use these things. Um, but I always envision the fact that it's something like they used to have in the 70s called a singles bar. And when you see a three and a three, why do people go into these singles bars? Well, they go in to find their perfect match. Three and three are perfectly compatible. So they get to actually come out of the bar. Why would they need to be in there any longer? And of course, they're one of those like Brangelina things, uh, the interactive couple that just sit together in such a way that they look like a single bee. So that three comes on the outside, leaving the two looking for love, and 35 times three is 105 root two. So let's go through some of these ourselves. When we look at the square root of 144, if we can express this as 12 times 12, because we know that one, then it's really easy. These get to pair up and they come out, get to be on the outside as that single annoying couple. There's nothing left on the inside. And so this one is just 12. 50, on the other hand, is a little bit more complicated. So we have to think about what it factors into. So I begin by factoring 50. Well, I could do it a number of different ways. I could do it 5 times 10 or 25 times 2. But I'm going for prime factorizations. So if this one is 5, that's 5 times 1. 5 times 1, it can't go any better. That's prime. But this could still be 5 times 2. That was a composite number. Now it's two prime numbers. So I can re- write this square root of 50 as square root of 5 times 5 times 2. And what that tells me is that because these two get to pair up and come out as that single 5, I'm leaving a root 2 on the inside. This is the equivalent of square root of 50. Now, I know that calculators these days and Photomath and Desmos and all these things will often give you that answer. In other words, you could just plug this into a calculator and have it tell you what it looks like in simplified fractional or rational form. Please don't rely upon that. You're going to get to something in advanced algebra and in pre-calculus where there are X's and Y's and Z's. 
and your calculator won't do that for you. So this is a skill you need to understand. What about number three here? Well, I'll take the number on the inside and I'll factor it as best I can. I don't know how, I, well, zeros, that means 10. So I could do 10 times 490, another 10, 10 times 49, seven times seven. Should I take these tens down to fives and twos? I could, but notice that I've already matched up. So there's really no point. I've got 10 times 10 times seven times seven. So the tens will match up. The sevens will match up. They multiply together and there's nothing left to be on the inside. So this one is simplified as 70. And again, they don't always come out that smoothly. Sometimes, for instance, with 20, I might see something like, okay, so 20 could be two times 10, which is five times two. And I see two times five times two. Ah, there is a pair of twos in there. So those come out, five is stuck on the inside, needing to do it themselves. Would you please now take a moment to do number five and seven? Let's see if you get these. Go. These ones didn't have too large numbers, so they shouldn't take too long. We're just factoring eight. So two times two times two. And you know, three of these isn't any better than two. We're talking about square roots where there's an assumed two on the outside. So you're only looking for things that pair up. One of the things I like about this inappropriate singles bar analogy is that if in fact it did have a three on the outside and we had something like two times two times two, then now you're just looking for things hooking up in groups of three and it would come out as a two on the outside. You'll learn that in advanced algebra. Okay, um, number seven, same idea. I can take 125 and treat this as 25 times five. So it's five times five times five. The fives pair up coming outside. This five is stuck on the inside. That's the simplification. Okay. So I wanna do number six and eight now because they're very different. Well, not very different, but what makes six different? Um, well, you already have a number on the outside. Yeah. Or outside. Yeah, there's a number on the outside. So we're gonna leave that there, but we're gonna follow the same process. I'm gonna take 32 and I'm gonna factor it. Maybe it's eight times four and two times four and oh, I could stop now if I were so inclined because I see that I've got a matched pair, but maybe not. And I take it all the way down. So I get two times two times two times two times two. And now I see that these twos are going to match up and these twos are going to match up. And all that means is that when I simplify it, I still had this six on the outside, but now I get an additional two from the purple ones I circled and an additional two from the blue ones I circled. And we've still got this green two left over on the inside. So six times two is 12 times two is 24 root two. Number eight is asking us to combine two terms. And really, we can't combine two terms unless they're like terms, right? We can do them with constants. If we have like 7 and 12, I can combine those because they're always the same. They're like terms. But I couldn't do x and y. And it looks offhand like these are not like terms. Like it's as simplified as I can. But we better simplify these first. Root 125 is something we've already done here. We know that's 5 root 5. Root 80, we're going to have to work on a little bit. So maybe it's 8 times 10, which is 4 times 2, which is 2 times 5. Please be careful that even if you see these twos as matching up and you're like, oh, great, I can stop. Recognize that there may be other terms, composite numbers, that you need to take further, as in this case, 2 times 2. So it looks like there's four twos. Let's move it down a little bit because there's not that much room. So 
So there are four twos and a five, which means I can match these twos up and these twos up. And I'm left with five root five plus two times two root five. In other words, I can say it's five root five plus two times two is four root five. Oh, these are the same type. Just like if I had five times x plus four times x, together those would make nine times x, or in this case, it'd be nine root five. You notice I've circled number nine for you here. I'd like that to be part of your homework tonight. I've also circled 10 and 12 because those should be part of your homework. We'll do number 11 because it's a little bit different. So this one is the product of two radical expressions. And when I have a number on the outside and another number on the outside, those multiply together on the outside. The numbers on the inside also multiply together. And really what they do is they multiply together under one big radical. Now, could I change this to 15 square root of 12, 180, 36, 216? I could, but again, I'm multiplying it up so that I can then factor it back down. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So I am gonna put the 15 out there, but I'm gonna take 12 and factor it into 2 times 2 times 3. And I'll take 18 and factor it to 3 times 3 times 2. And now I can see that these 2s are going to come out, and they kind of share this 3 pair that's going to come out. In other words, I'm going to get a 15 on the outside times 2 times three, and then stuck on the inside of these two that didn't match up. So those are a six. 15 times two is 30 times three is 90, square root of six. Any questions? Okay, 13, 14, and 15 are different. What makes them different is they've got fractions and radicals. So again, like we said in the introduction, if you have a radical of a fraction, you can treat that as a fraction of a radical or of two radicals. And hopefully when you look at these, you recognize these as perfect squares. The square root of 36 is 6, and the square root of 49 is 7. Therefore, this just becomes 6 sevenths. This one's going to be a little different, because 50 is not a perfect square root. So I'm going to need to express this one, square root of 50, as something other than just 50. So I'll do my factoring, 25 times two, five times five. So this is five times five times two. And 81, I do know, that's the square root of 81 is nine. My fives come out and I get five root two over nine. Number 15 is the same style with a little twist. So I can express root eight as two times two times two under the radical sign. And I can express root 18 as root three times three times two. 
And could I have chosen to multiply the top and the bottom by root 18? Yes, I could have. And in fact, you'll need to do that for number 19 down here. This is the one where you're going to multiply by root 6 over root 6. But I can also do it this way. And I see that on the top, I get 2 root 2. And on the bottom, I get 3 root 2. And just as if we were simplifying and I had something like 2 times 6 and 3 times 6, the 6s would cancel. This is being multiplied times the top and the bottom. Therefore, it's going to cancel. I'm going to get 2 thirds. All right, I'm asking you to please finish up the last six problems as well. So we've got six, seven, eight, nine total problems for your homework. This is your homework to complete this worksheet and submit it in Canvas. Those of you who uh, found a grade smacked you in the face a little bit, this is the way to bring your grade up. Do this. Do it now. It'll take you five, 10 minutes to get this done. Oh, 10, 12 minutes, let's say. And if you can't, if you can't fix the time in, maybe you just submit the notes as they are unfinished and know that you're going to get at least partial credit and not fall behind. Hopefully you guys can use your R4 grade as a window into what you need to do differently to get the score you want in this class and to learn the material. If you have any questions, you're welcome to hang out. Otherwise, you can take off and work on this stuff on your own. Thanks very much. I'll see you on Wednesday when hopefully you'll have the unit test done from similarity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank